Well, welcome to our worship service as we dedicate this time to uh, our God, our, uh, who is our Jehovah, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're glad that you're joining us here at Harlandale Christian Church today. We thank the Lord for all that he has done for us and how he is in our lives and, and providing for us and protecting us each day. The psalmist reminds us of this and points us to worship and praise the Lord in Psalm 99 where he says, The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim, let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion, he is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. And so we ask the Lord to bless us, to guide us, and to speak to us today. Let's pray to him. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to, to come to this house of worship and lift up your holy and precious name. Thank you for the opportunity for the, the ones who are joining with us online have that, that they can worship you uh, with us in your spirit and in your truth. Father, we thank you for your provision, for your love, for your protection. And so we praise you, O oh, great Jehovah, our God, our Father in heaven. Receive our worship and praise as we lift our hearts and our voices to you together. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. The promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God I shall prevail standing on the promises of God I now can see Perfect present cleansing in the blood for me Standing in the liberty where Christ makes free Standing on the promises of God of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God.
Each Lord's Day when we come together for our worship time, as we honor our God and we, we remember the sacrifice and the love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we share in our, our prayer time as we lift up uh, our praises and prayers for each other to our God, but we also share in this time of communion, participating in the, the Lord's Supper, using the bread that reminds us of the, the broken and, and pierced body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross, and the cup, the fruit of the vine, that reminds us of his blood that he shed for our sins to wash us white as snow. And as we partake, we're reminded of God's love, his forgiveness, and his promise that Jesus, his son, will come to receive us to him once again. In 1976, the Canadian singer Gordon Lightfoot uh, produced what he considered to be probably his finest work, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. It sings and, and commemorates the loss of 29 souls on a Great Lakes freighter. The song is written in the modern Doric mode. It gives it an eerie and haunting quality. But in the song, he includes this line. Does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours. The Apostle Paul would understand that question. In Acts chapter 27, Luke, Luke describes their experience of being shipwrecked in a storm. And I suspect that Jonah could understand that, quish, that question quite well. Navy veterans can recall, recall the Navy hymn, Eternal Father, strong to save all those in peril on the wave. It's the feeling of being helpless in the face of disaster, and every sailor knows it. Looking back on that kind of an incident, it, it does seem as if time somehow slows down, as if to give us time to question God's love. But Jesus knew that feeling as well. You, you'll remember that one of the last things that he said while he was hanging on the, on the cross was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where did the love of God the Father go during the trial and the execution of this most holy of men? Think about it. Was there ever anyone in history who was closer to our Father? Was there ever anyone in history who deserved the love of God more than Jesus, the Christ? Yet in his greatest hour of need, he cried that he was forsaken. One of the great joys of, of be, being a Christian is that your God became man and suffered just like we do. We may not have the answer to where the love of God goes, but we know that our Lord and Savior shares that question with us. Even more, more than that, the most popularly quoted verse of the Bible, John 3.16, tells us that God so loved the world. We might ask why he was forsaken, and we're told that it's because God so loved the world. The greatest possible display of God's love required that he take it from his own son. In communion, he asks that you remember this sacrifice. In the cup, we see his blood. In the bread, we see his body. In both, we see his love. In both, we see the anguish of the Savior. You have but a few moments. He had hours. Think about this then. The love of the Father at the price of the Son our man of sorrows. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the love that you, you have for all of us, for the world. And yet you loved us so much that you came in the flesh in your son Jesus with the purpose to die on the cross to bring us back to you through our faith and obedience and belief in him. Thank you, Father, for these emblems, the bread and the cup that remind us of your love, the sacrifice, and the hope that we have 
of eternity with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betray the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus.
Well, within the, na the history of our nation, there have always been men who inspired us with their courage, especially in the times of change or crisis. Men like Patrick Henry who said, give me liberty or give me death. Or Abraham Lincoln who reminded us that our nation was conceived in liberty and dedicated to the pr proposition that all men are created equal. And Martin Luther King, who dreamt of the day when his children would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Well, you know, in biblical history, great men have inspired us as well. Think of Joshua standing before the people saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Or the Apostle Paul who said, I can do all things through Christ who, who gives me strength. Or even Jesus himself saying, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Well, before Jesus came, a man named John. It was John who said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. It was this same John who said, after me comes one whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. And he also said, he must increase, I must decrease. In the world that we live in, we need the inspiration of men like these. They encourage us. They give us hope. They help us to see how we might live our lives better and at a higher level with greater intentionality and purpose and usefulness to the Lord. You and I become better men and women when we're reminded what a great life looks like and we're lifted up by them. So for the next several weeks, we're going to be lifted up together by the life of John, the son of Zechariah, the one who people called John the Baptist, and I call the forerunner. John was born six months before Jesus. He spent less than two years doing public ministry, yet Jesus called him the greatest person ever born of a woman. He's one of the least taught on lives in the entire Bible. And yet, he appears in over 23 chapters of Scripture. And that biblical record covers 2,000 years of history. John is spoken of in 750 years of that history. There are six facts that we can remember about John. First, he was the forerunner of Jesus the Christ. When the angel comes to Zechariah and, and he tells him that his son will be the forerunner of the Messiah, Gabriel said, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah in Luke 1, 17. The forerunner is the one who goes before. And that's where we get the title for this message series over the next few weeks. Because John goes before Jesus. The second fact, John was a relative of Jesus. His mother, Elizabeth, was related to Jesus' mother, Mary. And when the angel Gabriel announced, uh, announced to Mary that she was going to conceive the child, he said, your relative, Elizabeth, even she has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called childless. In Luke 1, 36. The third fact, John was the greatest man born of a woman. Look what Jesus says about him in Matthew eleven fourteen. 14. If you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. Elijah was the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. And the final words of the Old Testament are these. In Malachi 4, 5. I'm going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And Jesus said in Luke 7, 26. I tell you that he was more than a prophet. And then two verses later, Jesus says, I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John. You remember Muhammad Ali proclaimed himself to be the greatest. But Jesus gave that title to John. 
A fourth fact. John came to prepare people to receive Jesus. In John 1, 7, the Apostle John says about John the Baptist, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. So John's purpose was to prepare people to believe. In John 1, 31, John the Baptist says about himself, I came baptizing with water so he might be revealed to Israel. The reason he baptized people was so that they might be ready to receive Jesus when, when he came. And then in John 3, verse 30, John the Baptist says, He must increase, but I must decrease. So he's clear on his mission. It's not to draw attention to himself, but to point attention to Jesus. The fifth, John was Jesus' mentor and partner and inspiration. Every great turn in Jesus' life was influenced by John the Baptist. For instance, we'll, and we'll study all of these over the, over the next few weeks, but, but remember in Luke 1, 39-56, John's birth preceded Jesus and it actually encouraged Jesus' mother. And then John's baptism of Jesus marked the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Matthew 3, 13 through uh, the beginning of chapter 4. And as soon as Jesus was baptized by John, he went into the wilderness to fast for 40 days and then he started teaching and healing publicly. A sixth fact about John. John's ministry was a model for Jesus' early ministry. We find in John 3, 22 uh, and 23. In Jesus' first year of ministry, he did almost exactly what John was doing. And then fact seven. John's imprisonment prompted Jesus to begin choosing disciples in Mark 1. 15 to 16. In Jesus' first year, he built his reputation. When John went off the, the scene, then he began building a movement by, by calling and training disciples. In fact, eight, John's death prompted Jesus to retreat and perform the miracle of Moses in Matthew 14. Now, the miracle of Moses was the feeding of the 5,000. Moses fed the children of Israel manna in the desert and predicted that a prophet like himself would arise and do the same things sometime in the future. So Jesus fulfills Moses' prophecy by feeding the 5,000 by the Sea of Galilee. Ninth fact, John appears in 23 chapters of Scripture over a period of 750 years. You can take a look at many of these and, and you can find John's biographical material on your own during our study. So John's story and his very first message came 700 years before his birth did. It was a message of comfort and encouragement and hope. How many of you could use that today? I bet all of us could. The message was delivered not literally by John, but by God himself through the pen and the voice of the prophet Isaiah. So we open our Bibles to Isaiah 39. And to fully appreciate this message, you have to understand a little bit about what's going on in the people's lives at the time. During that, that time, the people of Israel were divided into two kingdoms. The kingdom of the north was called Israel. The kingdom to the south was called Judah. And at that time, the nation of Iran, for us today, was called Assyria in that day. And it was strong and aggressive, and it was on the march. They were conquering and gobbling up the nations all around them. And it was a frightening time if you lived in, in the vicinity so God does what he always does when his people are in peril. He sends them a prophet, a spokesman, 
to speak to them on his behalf. So God sends Isaiah the prophet to speak to the kingdom of the south. And for 36 chapters, Isaiah warns them that Assyria is coming and they're going to be judged for their sins. And then in chapter 37, Judah's king, Hezekiah, seeks Isaiah's counsel and prays. He asks God to forgive the people and to prolong their days in the, in the land. And God does this. And God says to King Hezekiah, Because you ask, I will postpone my judgment on Judah. Their punishment will not come by the hands of the Assyrians, but by the hands of the Babylonians years in the future. Remember, Assyria is modern-day Iran. And Babylonia is modern-day Iraq. Things haven't changed much over the last 2,700 years, have they? So Isaiah 39 ends with the prophecy that Judah is going to be overrun one day by the nation of Babylon. And verse 5 says, Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord, the, the, the Lord of armies. Look, the days are coming when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until today will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Some of your descendants who come from you, whom your father uh, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. In Isaiah 39, 5-7. Now friends, Isaiah spoke those words in 703 B.C. Put yourself in that place. Imagine how you'd feel if you learned that your children and grandchildren would one day be carried off into some foreign land and many of them would become eunuchs in the palace of a, for, of a foreign king. The people were devastated. They mourned. They cried out. And God heard their cries as He always does. And God responded, responded, as he always does. And so we have in Isaiah chapter 40, turn the page from the bad news of Isaiah 39 to God's good news of Isaiah 40. Verse 1, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and announce to her that her time of forced labor is over. Her iniquity has been pardoned and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now this is the passage that introduces the coming of the forerunner one day. Verse 3, a voice of one crying out, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make, straight, make a straight highway for our God in the desert. Every valley will be lifted up and every mountain and hill will be leveled. The uneven ground will become smooth and the rough places a plain. Now how do we know that these words are the words of John the Baptist? Because scripture says so. Matthew 3, Mark 1, Luke 3, John 1. They all, the gospel writers all quote Isaiah 40 and verse 3 and attribute the voice to John the Baptist. Here's the message that God gives these discouraged people of 700 B.C. and the discouraged people of every age. Verse 5, And the glory of the Lord will appear, and all humanity together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. One day the forerunner will come and declare that the glory of the Lord will appear and all humanity will see it. it. This is a message of hope and encouragement and community together. Verse 6, a voice was saying, cry out. And another said, what should I cry out? All humanity is grass and all is goodness and all its goodness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fade when the breath of the Lord blows on them. Indeed, the people are grass, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God remains forever. So he's saying, here's a little perspective, folks. We're not very big and we don't last very long. But God is big 
and His words and God's promises last forever. Verse 9, Zion, herald of good news, go up on a high mountain, Jerusalem, herald of good news, raise your voice loud, loudly. You know, this is where we get the song, go tell it on a mountain, when Isaiah's message says to do that. Raise your voice, don't be afraid, say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. So the first several verses are about John. And then verse 10 starts the words that John will say. See the Lord God comes with strength and his power establishes his rule. His wages are with him and his reward accompanies him. He protects his flock, flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them in the fold of his garment. He gently leads those that are nursing. Now, isn't that good? I think so. Friends, this is how God prepares the world for his son. This is the message of the forerunner. If you're discouraged, if you're afraid, if you're worried about what's happening to you, listen to what God tells us through the message of the forerunner. When I'm discouraged, God is not silent. God says in Isaiah 40, verse 2, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. You know, I like that word tenderly here. When we're discouraged, God speaks tenderly. Two chapters after this, Isaiah describes the tenderness of the Messiah this way. In chapter 42, he will not cry out or shout or make his voice heard in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed, and he will not put out a smoldering wick. He will faithfully bring justice. Think about it. How softly do you have to walk to keep from breaking a bruised reed? How softly do you have to speak to avoid blowing out a smoldering wick? You know, when the prophet Elijah was discouraged because Jezebel was seeking his life, the Bible says God spoke to him in a gentle whisper. When the Israelites were discouraged because the Babylonians were coming, God sent a prophet to speak tenderly to them. When the Israelites were discouraged because they were oppressed by the Romans, God sent John the Baptist to speak to them about what God was about to do. The forerunner's message to you today is, when you're discouraged, God will not be silent. God's speaking to you and me. He's always speaking. Sometimes we don't hear it because the TV is on, or we're on YouTube, or Facebook, or on Instagram, or we're playing our music so loud that it drowns out the voice of our God. Listen. Listen. And you'll hear the Lord. He is there. And he is not silent. The second thing the forerunner says is, God always has a plan for his people. Even when I can't see it. Verse 3 says, A voice of one crying out, Prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make a straight highway for our God in the desert. Every valley will be lifted up and every mountain and hill will be leveled. The uneven ground will become smooth and the rough places a plain. You know, when a king is coming into the court, what do they do? They ro roll out the royal carpet for him. But the forerunner is announcing the coming of the king of kings. And when he comes, John sa Isaiah says, forget the carpet. We're going to pave a, a highway for him. We're going to fill in the low spots and knock down the high spots so that he can come to us on smooth ground. When Martin Luther King wanted to encourage himself, he preached, every valley will be lifted up and every mountain and hill will be leveled because it reminded him that God was going to make everything right one day. What the forerunner is saying is, God has a plan, and his plan is to smooth it 
all over. The third thing that the forerunner says to us is, God always has words of hope for his people. Listen to this. And the glory of the Lord will appear and all humanity together will see it for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. And the fourth principle of the forerunner is God plans so thoroughly, he, can, he, he not only planned for Jesus, he planned for Jesus' forerunner. Verse 9 says, Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. See the Lord God comes with strength and his power establishes his rule. His wages are with him and his reward accompanies him. He protects his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them in the fold of his garment. He gently leads those that are nursing. Friends, these are Jesus' words about, um, about the Messiah. John is saying to the people, you may be scared. You may feel small. Your circumstances may seem overwhelming. But Messiah is coming. And he has strength that you can't fathom. Strength to overcome. So that when your trials come, you can stand. You can have hope. You can believe that this is not the end for you. For Emmanuel... God is with us and will be with you. So to a discouraged people who were worried that they were going to be conquered in the future, God delivered this message 100 years before the conquest came. And at the same time, God was delivering this message to a people who would come later. To the people of John and Jesus' day. People who had been conquered by the Romans. And at the same time, God delivered this message to us, to you and me. To a people who are tempted to feel conquered by cancer, by addictions, by debt, by feelings of loneliness and discouragement. Let me read this to you again, friends. Verse 11. He protects his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them in the fold of his garment. He gently leads those that are nursing. Raise your hand if you're, part of a, if you're part of God's flock. So don't fear. Don't be afraid. God will protect you like a shepherd protects his sheep. Even now, this moment today, He's wrapping his arms around you and carrying you next to his heart. I love this last phrase. He gently leads those that are nursing. God says to us through John, through Isaiah, I'm leading you. I'm gently leading you. You, my child, are in my arms. Isn't that great? The last thing I want you to hear from about the forerunner is that the, the forerunner was not the Messiah. He was a man, a human, a person like you and me. But God used his voice, his words to encourage people. And God can use you and your voice to encourage people as well. If you're discouraged, God will speak tenderly to you. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not put out. But God will also provide human voices and hearts and hands and prayers to help you to be that voice. Friends, God uses people to encourage discouraged people. I hope that this week you'll get to be a tender voice for someone who needs encouragement. After being introduced to the world by the forerunner, Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. 
and my burden is light. The forerunner, John the Baptist, is how God prepares the world for his Messiah. The words and the life of the, of the forerunner brought us the model of, our, of God's Son, Jesus, who now says, come to me. God has prepared a way for you and me to come to him through the Messiah, through his Son, Jesus. Our song of decision and dedication today is, I surrender all. I surrender all. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I surrender it all. Will you do that today? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your plan, for your purpose, for your love, for your son, the Messiah, the Christ. Thank you for for the words of Isaiah that point us to John, the forerunner, to prepare the way for your son to, be, to live here on this earth, to make a way, to help us, to encourage us, to save us. Father, today, help us to surrender our all to you by accepting your son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior in living in your love and in your grace. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.